create for those who still want to do a, some type of interviewing and recording of their grandparents and provide any tips. And so I did create a PowerPoint, which I will um, be sharing right now. And so the reason why I wanted to um, provide this is because I know that there's a lot of narratives out there that aren't being captured, especially when we're talking about um, history books and movies. And so there's not a whole lot of representation out there. And so I did want to open up uh, an opportunity for those of you who want to create more representation, create more opportunities for us to showcase like the experiences of what we actually go through. And so today I'm going to, today I'm going to um, talk about a little bit of the origin of the Hmong community and where we come from and our culture and traditions. And then I'll go into how uh, this actually ties into creating a narrative. And so I realized that I did introduce myself. And so my name is Mai Sue and I am the president of the Asian Pacific Islander Council here at Butte College. At Butte College, I work as a recruitment outreach technician. And so I go out and I talk to students, prospective students about Butte College, the things that we have to offer, majors, pathways that we offer. And then I also help students uh, apply to Butte College as well. So I do a lot of presentations, but I will say as much presentations as I've done in the past, I'm always nervous every time I start a new presentation. And so um, please bear with me as I go through this. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, put it in the comment box and I'll do my best to answer as best as I can. And during this time, I did um, have a video that I wanted to show, but because of the way that Zoom works, uh, the videos, and we tested it out earlier and the videos are just kind of glitchy. And so that video I will later put in the chat box for those of you who are on Zoom right now and are watching this through Zoom. And then I'll also post that video on our Asian Pacific Islander Council page um, on Facebook so that you can also see it on Facebook for those of you who are streaming live on Facebook right now. And so I wanted to give a little bit of a background about the origin of the Hmong people. And so the Hmong, the Hmong people are one of the many ethnic tribes, one of the many ethnic tribes of China. And so um, a lot of the Hmong people lived along the Yangtze River and the Yellow River. And so during, in China right now, there exists over 50 plus different ethnic tribes that still exist in China. And so the Hmong people are just one of these many tribes. And so for any of you who, who have ever studied like Chinese history or have done any type of like Asian studies, um, you might have learned that during the history of the Chinese people, there's a lot of like conflict between like different uh, tribes within China. And so right now the Chinese people that we see or the what we know as Chinese people right now is one of these ethnic groups and they're known as the Han Chinese and so if you go to China um, you'll you'll see that a lot of the majority of the people there are the Han Chinese but there's also all of these smaller groups and so during the history of China there's been a lot of like you know um, warring periods where people are trying to conquer and uh, assert their their power over other groups and so the Hmong people are just one of these people who um, were part of this conflict and so during this conflict because of it a lot of the Hmong people migrated down to Southeast Asia and settled in the hills of like Laos, Thailand and Vietnam to escape like persecution and so you can see this graphic right here a lot of the history of the Hmong people because we typically uh, in the past I we might have had some type of formal writing system, but as of right now, the only writing system was one create that was created for us. Um, and so a lot of our history, a lot of the stories that um, we pass down through generations are passed down through oral or through the story cloth that you see right here. And so this describes just some of the migration of the Hmong people. And there's a lot of people who, um, make these story cloths and so if you're interested um, there are a lot of people who make them and sell them and also just have them 
as just like a history and things to put up as decoration as well. And so, like I said, many of the Hmong people settled in the hills of Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. And so when you ask Hmong people about one of the most, um, one of the most important events that happened uh, in our history, a lot of us will point back to the secret war. And so during the Vietnam War, the Hmong people were recruited by the CIA to perform secret guerrilla warfare operations in Laos, which was declared a neutral zone. And so this was called the secret war. So during the Vietnam War, uh, Laos was actually declared a neutral zone and you weren't supposed to use Laos as one of the, um, as one of the countries to actually stage any type of war activity. However, the CIA recruited the Hmong people because they wanted to s sneak like troops into Vietnam through uh, Laos. And so they recruited the Hmong people to one, also help with um, the war, but also to help navigate the land because the Hmong people were familiar with the terrain. And so during this time, the Hmong people resided on this airstrip located in Long Gang. And so when I was younger, I heard my parents talk about this place and I've heard people sing about this place. And finally, when I got older, I was able to do a, some more research about what this place was. And so Lung Ging was actually the airstrip where all of, these, all of this warfare activity was happening. And so during this time, over 200,000 plus Hmong people resided in Lung Ging. And so they worked as um, military operators, they worked as technicians, a lot of people worked as like uh, restaurant owners. And so a lot of the Hmong people actually had a very good life in during this time at this location. And so um, a lot of Hmong people will talk about going back to Long Gang. And I, you know, I strongly remember like a song talking about this place. And so, um, uh, and then after the war was lost, uh, a lot of Hmong people fled into the jungles to avoid persecution because um, the Patetla was actually coming in and persecuting all of those who stood with the Americans. And so let me just go back really quickly. I do just want to point out this photo right here. This is General Vang Pao. He was sort of the leader of the Hmong people who fought for the side of the U.S. And so he helped to recruit a lot of these soldiers uh, who fought the war with, alongside the U.S. And so he is, pro is considered one of the uh, greatest leaders that the Hmong people have. And unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. And that was a huge loss that the Hmong people had. He was definitely one of the leaders that a lot of people looked up to. And so um, I did just want to point that out that this isn't just a random photo. It is a, an iconic photo of General Vang Pao. And so I do want to just um, provide an image of what this airstrip looked like. And so you can see that it's not a super long airstrip, um, but you can see houses that are around there. You can see the mountains that uh, separated, like uh, that covered this airstrip right here. And so um, during this time when the Hmong people fled, a lot of them fled to the jungles. A lot of them fled to Thailand to seek refuge. Um, many people died along the way, many people lost loved ones along the way, and right now there are still Hmong people who are still lost in the jungle. And so I do just want to highlight uh, that this war still hasn't ended for a lot of people. And so after the secret war, a lot of the Hmong people fled to multiple places around the globe to find freedom and safety. The U.S. being one of the places, um, but there are a lot of people who fled to other locations. I actually have relatives who live in France. Um, there's a lot of Hmong people who lived in who live in Australia now, and so a lot of us fled all over the world to seek refuge and freedom. And so, um, in terms of Hmong culture and traditions, a lot of the Hmong people. Um, do stick to the original beliefs, but there are a lot of Hmong people who um, ha have converted to like uh, Christianity. And so there is that break in the tradition as well. And so I do just want to highlight that it wasn't just um, General Vang Pao who was trying to 
bring his people out of uh, re refuge, but also a lot of missionaries help to bring a lot of Hmong people into the U.S. as well. So I do want to highlight that. Uh, but in terms of like the traditional culture and traditions that we hold, a lot of the Hmong people still keep to these traditions and they carry these traditions with them wherever they go. This is actually a photo of my family and this is my father and this is my mother. And this is a uh, blessing ceremony that we did for my, my father and my mother. A lot of times people will, will do these blessing ceremonies to provide just good health for the, the family and to ensure long lasting life for the family. And so you can see that there are strings that are tied around the wrist. And these are blessings given by people who tie the string and uh, say a blessing to the person as they're tying it to wish them good health. And so you'll also see there is a little like gift offering right here. And then we also have like trays that will collect money as well for the person as well, depending on what type of ceremony it is. And so I bring all of this stuff up because I think one of the things that are not captured, especially like when we're just, you know, studying different cultures and traditions are the very real experiences and stories of the people who live through these events. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to create this is because I wanted to provide an opportunity for people who are looking to capture these stories, looking to create these narratives and how do we go about creating these narratives for people? And so the first step that I wanted to encourage everybody to do is just identify who your subject is. And so once you have identified who your subject is, you can start to create what kind of narrative you want to create. And so for me, um, the first person that I did this for was my grandfather. So last year we did a big like birthday celebration for my grandfather and we decided that we wanted to also showcase a video of his life as well as what kind of a person he is and so we started to collect different um pieces to create this uh kind of like a short documentary of his life and so identifying your subject would be the first step and so for me it was my grandfather once you have identified the person or the subject, now you wanna look at the angle and who will tell the story. And so for us, we really wanted to capture his life and who he was as a person. And so a lot of the things that we knew about our grandfather is that he was in the military, that he lived in Laos and that he came to the United States around the mid 1980s, but everything else was not known to a lot of his grandchildren. And so when I talk about who will tell the story, it's really important to identify like key people who will be able to fill in some of the, um, some of the blanks that the person that you're interviewing, the subject uh, is missing. And so uh, for us, we identified three different um, people to tell this story aside from my grandfather. Um, we, we were able to interview two of my uncles and so two of my grandfather's son and they were also able to help tell the story and bring to light like different memories that they had of their father. And then we also wanted to provide a perspective from the grandchildren. And so my older cousin, one of my cousins was able to interview herself and send that video to me and I was able to add her perspective of being a grandchild to our grandfather. And so you want to identify who will tell the story um, because for me when I was interviewing my grandfather one of the things that we found is that um, like what I said there were missing pieces and so you want to be able to kind of have a variety of interviewees in your documentary. Um, I'm going to come back to the equipment really quickly and I'm just going to go into creating a life story and so it's not just you know about interviewing the person but you also want to provide like pictures and other narration to create a more engaging experience for your uh, audience. And so for us, we created pictures and then we also, um, I also came up with some narration of my own. And so one of the things that I do wanna uh, 
let you all know is that before we even started like the interview process, uh, my one of my cousins actually interviewed my grandfather and he collected the timeline of our grandfathers when they immigrated from China down to Vietnam and then who actually like our grandfathers, grandfathers, um, we actually got a list of all of those people and that actually was uh, perfect for the, the beginning part of the documentary because you got to see like where the origin of um, my lineage started, my family's lineage started, which started in China. And I just thought it was like super amazing because my grandfather, he's nearing 100 years old and he was still able to recall all of this details, all of this history. And so this is what I mean by like a lot of our history is passed down through um, oral, um, oral, how, how do I say it? <laughs> Um, but it's passed down orally and so for him it was like these stories that he had heard you know from his like uncles and grandfathers and so um i wanted to create that at the beginning of the documentary and then as we go through we got to hear from my grandfather and then pick up like different pieces from my uncles and then the last thing that we wanted to end with was just our us as grandchildren and how thankful we are to still have our grandfather alive with us um i do just want to just okay um so now i want to just go back to the ah sorry y'all i'm trying to figure this out too <laughs> sorry we're gonna have to go through this real quick hello my All right, so once again, who your subject is, um, identifying like the, the angle and the subject, what you wanna tell, and then equipment. So um, one of the biggest, I feel like, challenges is trying to find like equipment. And so I know that like when I was um, trying to create all this, we were kind of on a time crunch because our event was the first weekend of August and we decided to create this video literally like two to three weeks before the event. And so it was kind of like, we got to get this done. We got to put it together. And so really like when I think about creating like a documentary, I always think about like all these fancy like camera equipment and sound equipment. And then I realized I'm like, you know, you don't need like fancy things to create like an emotional and um, an emotional video that's going to allow your audience to understand the experience of this person and so um my cousin and i we literally we just grabbed our iphones i had a really basic like 20 dollars tripod that i bought and and then the editing software that i used was just imovie that was on my macbook and so this is literally all we use to create this video and so i do want to encourage you all that you don't need like super fancy equipment like you just want to be able to like telling the story is more important than trying to make it look like Hollywood or make it look like uh, cinematic. And so um, definitely just making sure that, you know, your equipment can capture what it is that you want and then go ahead and start editing. Like that's the biggest thing is just go in and start editing. And so I do want to kind of just go through like some of the steps that I went through. And so the first thing that we did was, of course, we found the uh story of our ancestors and how they migrated from China down to Vietnam. The second piece is interviewing my grandfather. And so I just want to like, I, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. When we went to interview my grandfather, we interviewed him for about an hour. And so a lot of the things that he actually talked about, I didn't include in this video. Uh, and you know, like our grandparents, a lot of times when they're telling stories, they could just keep going and they're talking about things that don't even relate to the question that you ask them. And so um, I want to encourage that you just let them like talk, like just let them go about what it is that they're trying to tell you. Um, because you can actually start to find like other things that pop up inside of that interview that you want to use too. And so um, even though sometimes they may go on tangents, you might find that those tangents can lead you to something that you were even thinking about when you started creating this um, 
project. And so we interviewed my grandfather. I think we had about probably 40 minutes worth of footage. And we probably, I probably used about like five minutes of footage. And so you can see like um, how a lot of the things that you, uh, like you want to make sure that you have a lot of footage that way when you are going to edit things that you're able to um, take different pieces and you have enough to actually uh, create what it is that you want and so really we weren't even thinking about interviewing like my uncles or anybody but as I was taking out his uh, interview and piecing it all together I realized that um, we needed more. And so that's when I decided, I called up my cousin. I was saying, hey, you know, I think we need to interview a little bit more people. And so we split off the task. So she interviewed one of my uncles and then um, I interviewed her father. And so the pieces that we wanted to add was uh, their experiences with my grandfather. And then for uh, my interview with my uncle, who is my cousin's father, my interview with him and consisted of his life in Laos. And so I wanted to know more about like who he was as a person, what type of titles did he hold as a, um, as a soldier. And so I really wanted to capture that experience. And then with my other uncle, we wanted to capture the experience of coming to the States. And so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing for now. <laughs> um, and so the, uh, the experience that we are, I'm trying, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out all of this. This is so interesting. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so with my other uncle, we wanted to capture the experience of coming to the United States. And so what my other uncle that my cousin interviewed was the first person in our family to actually immigrate to the United States. And so he was the one who started all of the paperwork to bring over the rest of our family. And so we interviewed him about that. And then we also captured the interview um, talking about like how his relationship with my grandfather as well. And so that was like the first set of interviews. And then, like I said, like we really didn't have a plan on how this is gonna be executed. We kind of just like started to, um, do things and then as we went and did things we realized okay this is what we needed so we got to go back out and um capture more footage and so there's kind of two ways that you can do it um i guess this the way that i i created this documentary is kind of how i work as a writer too um i usually don't plan out my writing i start to write and then as things start to unfold um it's, the story starts to reveal itself to me and so that's one way that you can do it if you're somebody who you know exactly what you want and you know how to like actually plan it out and you know exactly what you want to capture then you can do it that way too that way um you capture all of your footage ahead of time and then you can go in to start like piecing everything together and so the last piece that we had um on our interview was uh, an, an interview about uh, from a grandchildren's perspective. And so my cousin was able to um, provide just a video of her. Like I said, we were like, okay, time crunch. I need you to do this. She was like at the park with her daughters. She's like, okay, I'm just going to record myself talking. And so, like I said, like, even though these aren't like the most cinematic and most like beautifully shot, like videos, um, they still, the story that comes out of these uh, interviews were super, super, um, just emotional and uh every time i watch it like i just i just feel appreciative and i feel very humble to have had a grandparent a grandparent who can remember all of these different details and so um i did i actually wanted to show the video however like i said uh we were testing out the video earlier and we weren't able to actually uh, show it without it being like glitchy or cut off and so um, if you're interested in seeing this video, I will, uh, I'm going to link the video into the chat box for those of you who are on Zoom, and then I'm going to post the video on our Facebook page as well, the View College Asian Pacific Islander Council Facebook page, and so if you're not following us, please follow us on, um, oh my, what were you saying? You're on mute. <laughs> I was just telling everybody to follow us. Oh yeah, follow us. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, 
put the link right here. And hopefully if you have time today, definitely go check it out. Um, like I said, it's not like the best of the best, but it is very close to my heart and it is something that I'm thankful to have because um, I don't know how long, how much longer we're going to have our grandfather with us. And so I'm thankful that um, he's still here with us and that we have this video to show later on. And so at this moment, if you have any questions for me, I am more than happy to answer them. But if not, um, I do just want to give a quick plug about some of our next events that are happening. And so this is the first of many events that will be happening this month. We have a lot of uh, events talking about like experiences and just who we are. And so next week on Monday at 10 a.m., we will be showcasing our API um, power hour. And so if you're interested in listening to like music from artists who identify as Asian Pacific Islander, we will be launching an hour of music on SoundCloud. I'll probably post it on YouTube and then I'll put those posts, uh, those links onto our Facebook page as well. So definitely tune in. I've got a lot of like really good music. I've been super excited to like find all these new music. And so definitely check out that power hour. Um, that, that, th that music is going to be up the entire month of May. I'll probably stay up forever. <laughs> and so you're, you can access that at any time. And then next week on Tuesday at 6 p.m., uh, myself and four other awesome API staff and faculty, Hmong women are going to host the Hmong Women Voices event. And so this was an event that we uh, hosted back in March. Um, but we wanted to bring it back because one of our awesome participants was not able to be there with us. And so this time she will be able to perform her pieces. And so we're going to do that event again next Tuesday at 12 p.m. We do have a Zoom meeting created for it. Sorry, six, I said 6 p.m., right? Okay, did I say 12 p.m. earlier? <laughs> I'm at 6 p.m. May 12th at 6 p.m. next Tuesday is our next event. And then we have a couple more events coming up too, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll uh, shout out those events at next week's event as well. And then lastly, I do just want to say that um, it, was, it was actually kind of hard, I feel like, coming into this presentation today. Um, yesterday, I wasn't feeling very good. And then today, as I was working, I've been getting all of these updates about what's going on with the Black, the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the um, Black bodies that are being shot down right now. And so I wanted to just um, highlight that tomorrow, myself and my will be walking with, well, my's probably going to be running. I'm going to be walking. I'm going to run um, to your house. I'm running to your yeah. house. Yeah, so we're going to be doing the um, walk with Ahmad Aubrey, um, and I, I apologize if I mispronounced the name, um, but we will be doing that walk, and I encourage all of you to do as well so we can continue to bring awareness to police brutality and just like the injustices that our Black community is facing. Um, and then the last thing that I want to say and I want to leave with all of you is just that as we're going through these unprecedented times, Let's stand together as communities of color and continue to support each other on campus, off campus, in our communities. And so I want to thank you all for coming and supporting our AAPI Council event this, uh, this week. And I hope that you all continue to come to some of our other events that are coming up. I know that for a lot of us, we're working from home, we're working in um, you know, spaces that we don't normally work. And so uh, I want everybody to stay safe and I look forward to seeing all of you who are on here back on campus when we go back. And so have a good rest of your day. And thank you everybody for tuning in to today's event. Good job, Marcy. Bye everybody.